Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. John Yoon, all the way from America, from George Mason University, who will talk to us about big data as a barrier to entry. Thank you. Thank you, Waleed, and thank you, everybody here. And it's just a pleasure to be here in Latvia, and it's a wonderful country so far in a few, few days that I've been here. Um, so I'm going to go quickly. I, I don't have as long as Christian. I don't know how that worked out, but uh, I have 20 minutes. So I really want to go through the process of how to think about big data in the context of competition law uh, and the economics of that. And so first of all, how do we use data? And the term big data, unfortunately, has taken a life of its own. It's when we hear it, we immediately start thinking of certain concepts, and maybe even if it's nefarious and it's bad. But at its heart, big data is a lot of data. And what is data in of itself? It's facts and statistics we use to make decisions, analysis. And the way that we use it in the competition context is that firms, we assume, are maximizing profits. And profits are based on a number of factors, primarily price and quantity, but also the quality of your product, the level of innovation, and the cost structure that you can have. So to the extent that firms can use data to improve those elements, improving their profitability, which in turn improves their, their consumer surplus and consumer valuation, then that can be a very good thing. And so data can be very good, and firms can use it in positive ways. Of course, not always positive, but that's the, the central idea. So I want to start with not so big data. Let's go back to an era that's outside of the current era of internet. And I want to talk about a and P. I don't know if you guys have heard of this uh, grocery chain. If you're, if you're really young, you probably haven't. But um, it's the Great Atlantic um, Pacific and Tea Company, which was from 1915 to 1975, was the dominant supermarket chain in the US. It was the Amazon and Walmart of its age. And I want to give you a quote from, from Muris and Nectarline, who did some research on AMP. AMP grocery chain was a vertically integrated retailer that made use of unprecedented scale and innovation to offer consumers a wider range of products than the competition at lower prices. So its success was primarily due to four key factors. The first was it was vertically integrated in its own distribution. It owned its distribution, which was very different for its time. The second, it won very deep discounts from wholesalers. And we'll see that this actually got them in trouble. Um, very similar to Walmart today, they source their products at a very aggressively low price, which then they in turn pass on to their consumers. Number three is also vertical integration, but this is in food production. Not only do they own their distribution networks, but they actually made their own food and products, which at that time was revolutionary. And number four, and relevant for today, is how they use data. They were one of the first to use data in a way to really improve their products, see how com customers were responding to prices and quality offerings, and made adjustments based off that. Let me again give you a quote from Muris and Nectarline that really highlights how they use big data, which is a little bit different from how we think of big data today, but at the time it was big data. AMP used such data to meet previously unrecognized regional preferences. Philadelphians, it found, like their butter lightly salted with light straw color, whereas New Englanders preferred more salt and a deeper yellow color coloration. And the company's massive sales data allowed AMP's bakeries to forecast demand with a high degree of accuracy, minimizing returns of stale bread and donuts, and thus reducing costs and ultimately retail prices. So um, getting big data and improving bread and butter, literally their bread and butter, uh, was part of the AMP strategy. I don't know if you guys have that term here, bread and butter. In the US, that means what you're really good at. So this was literally what they were good at. So that was kind of a fun example. But this created backlash. Um, in the US, they instituted a number of things that actually went after AMP and their model. The first was state and federal taxes were passed specifically against uh, retail chains like AMP, but exempted local chains or local stores uh, that didn't have the same model. So they were increasing their costs based on this to help other competitors. They also passed 
what is still with us today in the U.S. in 1936, the Robinson Patent Act. And what this did is it, um, it made it illegal to price discriminate. And what this means is that wholesalers who gave AMP a better price, it was deemed to be illegal. You had to give everybody that lower price, or you don't give anybody that lower price. And it's still in the books today, but it's completely neglected in the U.S. Price discrimination is a phenomenon that occurs every day in the U.S., and it's not illegal, even though on the books it technically is, according to the Robinson Patent Act. But that was passed specifically to address AMP's more aggressive wholesale prices. And, and finally, the Sherman Act, which is the primary act, along with the Clayton and FTC Acts in the U.S. that governs antitrust, uh, the Department of Justice brought a criminal case against the exec executives uh, for various uh, anti-competitive practices. And they even contemplated breaking up AMP. Now the administration changed and, and the case eventually lost steam even though the DOJ won at the district and the, and the appeals court level. They finally made a consent that wasn't very, very strong, but ultimately that really did hamper the company and it started their slow decline. Uh, pretty much soon after all these changes were made. So why do I start with that? Why, why am I talking about AMP when we're probably more interested in big data? Maybe we're interested in AMP. But here's something from The Economist, uh, an article they wrote. The Internet Titans Alphabet, which is Google, uh, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft look unstoppable. Old ways of thinking about competition devised in the era of oil look outdated in what has come to be called the data economy. A new approach is needed. So, okay, do we need a new approach? Because these firms, in addition to other things, own a lot of big data. Well, we've talked about what big data is. Others have addressed it. Um, it's really the volume, the depth, and the detail of the data has changed since the AMP times, right? So that's what's the big difference. In addition, it's how we analyze that data and our ability to unlock value from that data and the tools we use is also different. And before I want to go on, I do want to say small differences in firms' abilities to unlock and extract value from data can create very long competitive distances over time. So what do I mean by that? Let me just throw up a, a brief uh, graph here. So let me explain this. This is, let's say, you are improving your product at a 1% rate. And this shows you after 5 years, 10 years, and 15 years. 5, 10, and 15. So let's say that you personally are improving your intellectual capital 1% each year. Well, after 15 years, you're going to be 22% better, which is great. And that's why we learn and we try to improve ourselves, because over time, we hopefully are getting better and not worse. Let's say that you have a 5% growth rate. Right? You're improving yourself or your product or your profits at a 5% rate, which is obviously a lot more than one, but it's not a crazy difference. You can see that you're starting to really unlock value over time. Let me just point you to a 15% growth rate. So you are 15% better than your competitor at unlocking value from data. You can see that over time, your competitive distance is going to grow exponentially. And the reason why I illustrate this is because very small differences in how firms can unlock and extract value from data over a number of years will turn out to be Firms are very large and you have very small companies, even if they started in a very similar place. I emphasize that because um, I think someone mentioned earlier how there's data available, but sometimes state governments as well as firms don't quite know what to do with it. And so McKinsey and Company, they did some research looking through various industries and firms about their ability to unlock value from data. And I won't go through all the... All the um, statistics on this, it, it's very, very hard to read and it's small, but they go through various industries and the darker it is, more intense they're using big data. High tech, no, no surprise, automobile, finances, resources, media, they're all sort of heavy in big data in the various aspects of big data. 
But as we go down here, travel and tourism, healthcare, building materials, they're using big data a lot less. Even within industries, the ability for firms to unlock the data is uneven. The main conclusion is that when we hear big data, we immediately think that, oh, that means that they have a competitive advantage. Rather, maybe we should rethink of how we think of big data, rather, in that they unlock the value from big data better than their competitors. So what are the virtues of big data? And we'll talk about the vices as well. The virtues is it can certainly lower costs and generate great efficiencies. Walmart, to, uh, which might surprise some, is pretty much one of the largest big data firms in the US. They use an enormous amount of data, much more than a lot of these internet companies. And while they have an online presence, it's primarily for their brick and mortar stores. Improved product quality, uh, Christian mentioned the superior algorithm of Google, and that takes a lot of effort. There's a lot of, there's still competition, more so in the US than I think in Europe. Bing is still used in the US, so is DuckDuckGo, um, but, but it's certainly fading. They implement almost 500 to 600 algorithmic changes every day. They're conducting experiments constantly. Amazon is in a very similar boat. They are always innovating and changing their product based on user data. And advertising targeting. Um, to the extent that we get advertising, and I'm not saying we all like advertising, we might like, like it during certain times, um, given that we're having advertising, we prefer it to be better advertising, and certainly firms are using that to target the advertising better. But perhaps there are vices to big data, right? And the primary vice um, that people are hypothesizing is, does it allow a small group of fir firms, this, this FANG, the Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, um, does it give rise to competition issues? The fact that they have this big data, is it creating a barrier to entry that doesn't allow a competitive and vibrant market for consumer attention? They're so far ahead with this data, they just keep getting more and no one can catch up and so we effectively have a monopoly. Is that what's happening? And finally, there are privacy and consumer protection concerns, but that's sort of outside the scope of, of what I do, and so it will be outside the scope of what I want to talk about. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about causality, and causality is really important to economists, um, and it's often, I think, misunderstood in terms of causality. First, are firms successful because of big data, or is big data a byproduct of success? Or maybe just to stop with the questions per se and frame it a different way. Is big data one component of many in which firms compete with each other? You can imagine that innovation is incredibly important in these areas. If in Medicare, in medicine, consumer products, as well as internet, we wouldn't probably ding firms for having great innovative products, but it creates competitive distance. We wouldn't call innovation a barrier to entry. But in a similar way, and you can make some analogies, if you have data and you unlock it in a way that creates value and it starts creating competitive dis distance, why are we viewing that necessarily as different as innovation per, per se? Because in, in one respect, it is a form of innovation. Um, and second, big data in of itself does not give you success. We can Go no further than Google Plus. I don't know if you guys ever got Google Plus here in Latvia, but in the US, it was a dud. I mean, Google had all the data you can imagine, but it's basically been closed as a failed social experiment in terms of social uh, media. Um, and Google was huge. But instead, you have very smaller search engine, not search engine, um, social media that's very successful even on a small scale in the US and growing. Take Google ITA. ITA is this upstream firm that had a lot of the travel data and Google purchased them and a lot of people were upset about that. They predicted that Google would put Expedia and Travelocity out of business and that is, has proved not to be true. So even having ITA and all the data they have, they are still well behind these travel firms.
Take, for instance, Uber and Lyft. They entered and they were successful in the U.S. because they had a different business model, a two-sided platform, which um, Christian said, you know, what is Google a two-sided platform or not? So I'll, I'll interject and say they are because uh, I, I will agree, according to the OECD definition, it probably isn't. But that's part of the problem with platforms is that there's a lot of definitions. There's no canonical definition. But at its heart, two-sided platforms are about cross-group effects where the presence of one group affects the valuation and demand of another group. To the extent that you have at least one cross-group effect, and typically you have two, you have a two-sided market in my view. Okay. But Uber and Lyft, they entered, even though taxi cabs, they have enormous amount of data. They never, tra never tracked it, at least in the U.S. And now that's changing. They're, they're more incentivized to become automated and track sort of their passengers and their, their demands and their pricing. But at the time, Uber and Lyft came in with a superior model and gained a lot of share, right? So it wasn't data per se that made them successful. Okay, so role of scale and and success. This is following on the theme I just mentioned earlier. I want to talk about open table. Do you guys have open table here? So what it is is it a reservation platform. You join and restaurants join and allows you to make reservations without calling the restaurant. And so what open table tried to do when they first started is to gain scale. They try to get as many restaurants as possible, they try to get as many consumers as possible, and they were almost about to go out of business. But they changed their strategy. They said, well, let's just get really, really exclusive good restaurants. And forget about trying to sign up the McDonald's of the world. And no one cares. Well, you can't make a reservation at McDonald's. I don't know what I'm talking about. But um, really, of the reservation world, the McDonald's of the world, they didn't want those. Let's curate it and get just the best restaurants. And that really started their growth. And they sort of maintain that model today. They don't have every restaurant in the US but they have a lot of the important ones. So that's another episode where it's not data per se, it's the type of data and how you use it for your particular business model that can determine success. Okay, so the final topic I wanna to discuss is, is big data a barrier to entry? For those of us who are interested in competition law, this is a term of art. A barrier to entry is something that prohibits and limits entry. Entry is incredibly important in the context of competition analysis. Along with efficiencies, it moves us from the static world to a dynamic analysis of competition. And that's really what you need to do, when you, especially when you talk about these internet platforms and companies. If you're in the static world, you're going to be very dated very soon. So what I want to do is walk you through the evolution of the thought of big data, or excuse me, barriers to entry, and then mix it in with the context of big data. And obviously, I don't have a ton of time, so I'll do this very quickly. And we're going to move from Bain um, to Stigler to Demsets. Now, there's a lot here, but effectively, Joe Bain from Harvard was one of the pioneers of defining barriers to entry. And what he effectively said is, barriers to entry are, are exogenous factors within an industry that allow firms in that industry to earn price above marginal cost. Price above marginal cost is the code word in economics for monopoly type profits. Doesn't mean you're the single seller, it just means you have a high degree of market power. What determines market power? And what determines the preservation of that market power? And Bain basically said, well, there are characteristics of industries that will help you predict whether firms get market power. And he listed a few. Um, economies of scale was one of the most important that he mentioned. Differentiated products was another. And so this view of the world has subsequently been rejected. There has an, an, an intuitive appeal, right? Is there characteristics of the market that keep firms out that you can't compete with? Right? There's an appeal to that. And because of those characteristics, you're going to have a certain performance and you're going to have certain conduct. So we've called that paradigm the structure conduct performance paradigm, which for those who are in competition most likely have learned that paradigm. And empirically, it's shown to be invalid. Right? So we've moved on. Can we move to something more sophisticated? And George Stigler did from the University of Chicago. And he refined Bain's definition just slightly. What he said are, barriers to entries are 
costs that income, or excuse me, entrants have to incur, but incumbents, those already in the market, do not. So what are examples of that? Classic examples are patents. Patents are things that allow, let's say, the incumbent to initially start a market. But since you're prohibited from using that idea as an entrant, you have to design around it. So presumably, that makes you more inefficient to compete in that market. In a similar way, grandfathered regulations. What that means is that after a firm enters, the regulation changes or they lobby for a change in the regulation that makes it more difficult and onerous for new firms coming in. So the old firms are grandfathered in in that they don't have to conform to the new regulation, whereas the new firms do. So they, again, are now a more disadvantaged. And the, the virtue of Stigler's definition over Bain's is it was getting at real exogenous factors that can disadvantage an entrant relative to the incumbent. But now I think that we, the best one, the one that we've moved to largely, uh, at certainly the economists in the US, is Demset's definition. And he's basically saying that, look, all these ideas of exogenous factors affecting your performance is wrong, in that a lot of this stuff is endogenous. The level of product differentiation is a firm choice, not exogenously determined. So rather than focusing on what is and what is not a barrier to entry, let's focus in on what really, what are the things that an entrant has to overcome to compete successfully within each market. So effectively, it's a fact-based inquiry about entry rather than labeling things for all markets as barriers to entry. So leading to big data, where, where does this put us with big data? I want to take the DEMSETS approach and say, rather than saying big data is a barrier to entry, and then we start thinking, oh, that protects the incumbent, let's look at each market and say, how is data used in those markets? And subsequently, what are the, what's the history of firms in their entry in this market? Did they all need the big data? Maybe. Or did they come in successfully without big data? And big data was really a byproduct of the success and not really the predictor of the success per se. OK, so let me conclude with just a couple of studies that really conform with this DEMSETS idea. Um, and these studies are ongoing in the US, and so they certainly can evolve. And, and you, you might have studies that come up with different conclusions. But this one, the first one is by Lambert and Tucker, Catherine Tucker, who was at uh, MIT, they, they looked at search engines and their use of big data, and they concluded that it does not give them a sustainable competitive advantage. First, you don't need a lot of data to improve your product. It's really how you use the data. And second, the historic value of data depreciates very quickly. So someone asked, how long should we keep data? Well, certain types of data you might want to keep for a while, but certainly for Google, the val val it depreciates very, very quickly. And so it's not your history per se, it's your current period. Shep and Wambach, um, the origin of many innovative startups illustrates that companies with smaller but possibly more specialized data sets analyze experience may uh, challenge established companies. So again, it's the type of data that you have, your business model, and how it feeds into improving your product rather than sheer size per se. Um, I want to point to another paper by Booten and Clemens uh, where they talk about an episode in 2008, the European Commission considered entry unlikely by firms offering internet-based map applications. Um, yet, the year after, Google, they were looking at TomTom. Tom. Uh, the year after, Google entered with their own navigation-based system. So I don't want to just pick on the Europeans. Commission, well, why not? It's kind of fun. But in the US, we always do it. I'm sure you do the same for the US. It's all fun. But um, at the end of the day, predicting markets, especially these type of markets, is very difficult. Um, and so we have to be very flexible in our tools. And so the main message is just to, because firms have big data, to label them monopolies, incumbents, and insurmountable, I think, can make uh, bad competition uh, decisions. So with that, I want to. I'll conclude. Right. Quest questions, anyone? 
you for your presentation. Um, uh, at the beginning, you were talking about A and P uh, being as a very successful um, company that used used data, and you said that it's vertically integrated, and yes. that that was one of the successes. Mm -hmm. um, but now, thinking about the big uh, companies, big tech companies like Google, and uh, about their strategies, that they are actually acquiring smaller uh, smaller startups, yes. for example, DeepMind or uh, Internet of Things companies, and they're moving into, into these new areas. Yes. Uh, don't you think that this is also kind of a risk? Uh, and uh, don't you think that competition uh, authorities should actually look um, at, for example, mergers where at the outset, probably they don't raise any concerns. But then when you think about uh, this possibility of vertical integration and what it does to the market power of the income of the big tech companies. So maybe what, what's your view on that? No, I, and it's a very good question. And it's a big question in the US in that um, should we allow or maybe have different standards for firms that have a large share in the sense that they are purchasing Competitors who at the time are not competitively significant but can be over time and represent a threat to those firms and they see that. So one, question, one thought though is if we had a special rule then it effectively penalizes firms after a certain size for making acquisitions which I think most would accept can be pro-competitive in certain instances. It allows them to improve their product much faster and if you have a large platform the interesting thing is if you can implement that quality improvement from purchasing an innovative startup, it actually affects more people and they might be able to implement it more quickly. And so we lose that consumer benefit, but I hear you about the thought of the harm. And um, I think that's a real thing and I think that's a, a very fair concern. You know, a lot of people in the US point to Facebook purchasing Instagram and now Instagram is the number two social network in the US. And everyone's like, oh, but if it was, if we stopped it, they could have been an independent Facebook against Instagram. And that sounds like a nice world. But let me ask, posit this as well. At the time they purchased them, Instagram had 12 employees. They were in existence for one year. And they had revenues of like $50 million. And they were losing money. You know, if we got, could get in our hot tub time machine. Did you guys get that movie here, the hot tub time machine? Let's talk about the flux capacitor, the, the back to the future. The, that's better. Let's get out of the hot tub. Uh, the flux capacitor, if we go back in time, you know, maybe we could have stopped that. But those facts are very difficult to say, oh, they should have jumped in. Secondly, what's the counterfactual? Given that they purchased Instagram, do we want them to fail and say, oh, it's OK, they, they went out of business, Instagram sucked? Isn't it kind of the result we want that they purchase a startup they innovated, invested a lot of money, and they're now actually a successful firm. Like, what would we want? What would be like a good purchase of Instagram? It's, it's kind of successful, but it's not. So I, I find the counterfactual is odd that because they're successful, that means it was anti-competitive. Maybe because they're successful, it was pro-competitive. It's just a, a thought, but um, an excellent issue. And, really probably the number one issue in the conferences I go to in the US, that issue. Thank you. Any, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much, John.